This particular lecture is going to be about subsistence strategies. And now while this is a part of the economic system, we're talking about it separately because it conditions virtually every other social institution. It's incredibly influential. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll understand why, and particularly by the end of the quarter, that will be totally clear to you. There are four types of subsistence strategies. There's foraging, pastoralism, horticulture, and intensive agriculture. We're going to break them down and look at them one by one. Foraging is basically hunting, fishing, and gathering. So 85% of the food for foragers comes from resources that are available in nature. For 90% of human history, people were foragers. Today, we only have about a quarter of a million people. Foragers make their own tools. Now in anthropology, we kind of refer to this as simple technology. That's not a qualitative statement. We're not trying to say that making your tools by hand is a bad thing. It's just that there's not complex machinery with all these various parts and so forth that you have to use to actually make the tools. The reason for production is that we're going to share the resources in addition to using them for ourselves. So it's a very communal mindset. Groups are egalitarian, and what we mean by this in anthropology is not that everybody's totally equal. When we do see any kind of status as a ranking in egalitarian societies, it's usually based on age. But egalitarian in, in, in an anthropological sense means that each individual has access to resources that they need to survive. And additionally, everybody's going to have the skills that they need to survive. We see relatively small communities. And that's so they don't take away or reduce all of the resources in a particular area. Hunter, hunters and gatherers, foragers, are highly mobile. You will occasionally see foraging societies that are relatively sedentary or they stay in one place for long periods of time, but the resources have to be incredibly rich for them to stay in one place for a long period of time. We see high infant mortality, and again, this is because of the mobility factor. We have overlapping gender roles, and what we mean here is that the division of labor often falls out by gender, but again, everybody has those skills they need to survive. So if we have a group where men are predominantly the hunters, women can also hunt if need be. Men can gather, women can gather, everybody can make tools, everybody can make the appropriate clothing for their culture and the appropriate shelters. So again, it gets back to that egalitarian nature where everybody has the skills that they need to survive. High degree of sustainability. Hunters and gatherers, or again foragers, could really go on for very, very long periods of time if they're left alone. Unfortunately, what's happening in the modern world is, world is that they're being relegated to marginal areas, so it's much, much harder for them to survive. So, high, But it is a high degree of sustainability. We're going to use the Kung as an example. Uh, the Kung live in the Kalahari Desert. They don't have a big migratory territory. Um, vegetation is scattered, um, but they do move around to wherever they can find resources. They use about 100 species of animals, with 50 of which they eat, and they use over 150 species of plants where they eat over 100. Now, if we look at the Kalahari Desert, we just don't see a lot of plants, but the Kung, who live in it on a daily basis, can really differentiate between different kinds of plants. <coughs> Their favorite food is the mangango nut, and it's very high in protein. So in the times when they can't get a lot of meat, that particular nut really serves them well. The Kung eat their way out of areas. So what we're talking about here is that they eat all of the food they like first, then they eat their less desirable food. And once that's done, then they leave so that the resources have time to regenerate. So they're mobile when resources get low, or sometimes they move seasonally. So in dry season, we see large camps of 20 to 40 people, and they gather around permanent water sources, so makes sense in the dry season. In the rainy season, we see much smaller camps, maybe two to three families, and they're scattered all over the landscape. More resources around, so they don't need to be bunched up together. Again, high degree of mobility in foraging societies. We see a low number of possessions, because if you're on the move a lot, you don't want to haul a bunch of stuff around. And again, limited population growth. Division of labor in the Kung, everybody gathers 
everybody hunts, food is shared with all of the members of the group, if there are any possessions, those are shared among the group, and there's very, very little inequality. The Kung reckon their kin relations on both sides, which in anthropology we refer to as a bilateral system. And when we get to family, marriage, and kinship, we're going to go into that in more detail. Um, one of the things about the Kung, they do have contact with the, quote, modern world, unquote. So they're very quick to incorporate new technology. And most of their contact with the more modern world comes with contact with agriculturalists, um, governmental officials, and also traders. So that's basically a foraging society.